Don't you think I'm joking? I'm not. I promise you. Coming her butt and no babies are coming. Period. And you think I'm lying. You want to you wanna talk about jokes. Wait until that child support hits you. Check the next 18 years. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Believe you me, the Schleg Daddy, can tell you it's no laughing matter. Ha ha ha. Indeed not. But anyways, make sure you let me know when we're live. Gotta get this right this week. What? God damn it, we're professionals here. Every week, it's the same thing. An award-winning YWC journalist like myself, the Schleg Daddy, has to put up with this Bush League bullshit, my balls blowing in the breeze. What is this, amateur hour? Unbelievable. Do you think the Sala Monster has to deal with this? There's a reason he could be the cougar killer. There's a reason he's the hashtag soothing Sala Monster. And the simple reason is, is he's been able to find good help. And of course I haven't. And we're going to rectify that really soon. Unbelievable. But anyways, as I said, I am your award-winning YWC journalist, The Schleg Daddy, and welcome to another edition of the Off the Rope Show here on OTRS Central. And we've got a great show for you this week, a slight change in format. Instead of diving into one, maybe two issues and really having at it, I've decided to shake things up and do a little bit more of a podcast-style type of show. Let's see how this goes, where I'm talk about things that were in the news, uh, what's still to come, some of the hot rumors and trends throughout the week that was in professional wrestling. Now, before we get to this week's show, a couple things I want to touch on. First and foremost, the OTRS Central show, channel, whatever the hell you want to call it. Bottom line is, we've got t-shirts now. Damn it. I'm waiting for mine to come in as we speak, as a matter of fact. So what should you be doing? Checking out the OTRS Central store at Pro Wrestling Tees. And for all of you that said all these years you wanted some t-shirts, well, here's your chance to get in on the fun. Let's take this shit worldwide. That's right. Click on the link and hashtag buy a shirt. It's not that hard. It's not that bad. And then, you, if you haven't done so already, look at that little button that says subscribe, and you hashtag subscribe or die. And then, what the hell, next thing you do is hashtag click the bell. So that way, if YouTube's notification system actually works, which would be a funny concept, you'll be notified immediately when a new episode of the Off the Rope Show or any other great content from OTRS Central is put out there. And make sure you follow the show on Twitter at OTRS Central is the channel's Twitter handle. And then Facebook, facebook.com slash OTRS Central. All of that information, of course, will be in the description box down below. Are you excited? Are you pumped? Are you geeked? Eh. Some of y'all probably pretend like you watch it and then you really didn't. Some of you might make it halfway through. So what the hell? For those of you that are about to go bell to bell, I thank you. Let's go ahead and get this show on the road. And no more Bush League mistakes over there. Let's start the show off by talking about some of the biggest news items of the week. What's been in the news? Uh, within the last couple of days... We had to come down the pike that Talking Smack was canceled. Even though I don't know how a show is fully canceled if it's still going to be running in some capacity. That, that isn't canceled. Canceled means that it's no longer going to be airing, period. Now, it's changing from being a weekly recap after SmackDown and 205 Live on the WWE Network to being just after uh, SmackDown branded pay-per-views. So it's a change, but it's not canceled. And all these people that are talking about it's canceled. If it's still existing and being done in any way, shape, or form, that's not canceled. And you're idiots for saying it. But for those that are sitting there and getting into this big uproar and getting their flaming keyboard fingers of fire talking about how this sucks and this show is used to get people over. Really, honestly, who fucking watched Talking Smack? Out of a SmackDown audience of, what, two to two and a half million viewers, whatever the hell the number is, what percentage of them were actually staying... Uh, after SmackDown gets done at about 10 o'clock Eastern on, on USA Network every Tuesday, then watching 205 Live, and then watching Talking Smack. And what percentage of your about 1.5 million worldwide WWE Network subscribers was actually watching this? How 
can you tell me that this was used as a great device to get a lot of people over when the vast majority of your audience wasn't fucking watching and they weren't fucking watching just because you watched didn't mean that 80%, 85% of the audience was watching along with you. It means probably 80 to 85% of the audience wasn't watching with you. Now, did they back off of this because it wasn't getting good viewership? I don't know. You put it after 205 Live instead of having it be directly after SmackDown. What the hell did you think it was going to happen in terms of any viewership? Because if SmackDown didn't drive anybody away for the night, 205 Live and the suck hole that's become most certainly has um, driven people away. Is it Vince McMahon and some of the late reports, I think from Sports Illustrated, that he didn't like the free-flowing nature of the show and it didn't fit in? You know, it's something you could buy. But I don't know if I totally buy that. I don't know if I totally buy that it wasn't getting some type of viewership. I just think it's one of these things where instead of WWE uh, focusing on cutting expenses where they should, <coughs> WWE Studios, uh, they look at stupid things like this that really don't matter in the grand scheme of things and you get rid of them. You know, and, and the whole thing is, is you need content for your network. Why would you get rid of content like this for your network? It's one thing if you cancel Renee's, what was it, Unfiltered Show? that was talking about current items. It doesn't have a ton of replay value. Talking Smack could potentially have some replay value. I just don't see why the WWE was so fixated on getting rid of this. With that said, I don't see where this is that big of a fucking deal. Because again, I assure you, I promise you, the majority of the subscriber base wasn't watching this crap, and the majority of the people that watch SmackDown, at least here in the US every week, and probably around the world too, aren't watching it. How is it getting people over if the majority of your audience isn't watching? Sure, for the circle jerk of people that are watching, it could sit there and get certain individuals a different light, a different exposure, and might get them more over with them. But again, that is a minority of the audience. You have a wide swath of the audience that wasn't watching and didn't care. And frankly, when it comes to this talking smack thing, who cares? Stop bitching about it. There are other things with WWE to bitch about. If anything, the real question should be, why was WWE so fixated on getting rid of this? And now we're at that point where running this little show each week was so necessary to cut from a production cost standpoint. That's the bigger question we should be asking. That's the deep, deeper seated and deeper rooted issue that needs to be addressed. Because otherwise, I just don't see what the big deal was. And I don't see why they even bothered. Uh, so anyways, moving on, you guys can shit on me in the comments. I don't really care. Uh, moving on to Global Force Wrestling, of course, uh, the big news for them this week was that they ultimately suspended Alberto El Patron, and some people were talking about how this was a great move. This, the real truth is, is this was a nothing move right now, other than what, him not being able to work house shows? He was so ingrained into the television over the next several weeks, television that's already been taped, that the next time you even really have to face any type of issue with this comes August 17th at Destination X. This is a suspension that is good in PR only, but doesn't really have a lot of practicality because you couldn't just edit him out of the shows, especially since you just made him the world champion. What I find really interesting is why so many people are excited about Alberto El Patron, who presumably is innocent until proven guilty in this country, or at least he's supposed to, getting suspended without pay, you would assume. But Paige isn't suspended, even though she was part of the incident. It just, again, as I talked about in the video several days back, what if Alberto Al Patron is innocent? It's this whole thing of, because people like Paige, apparently, and they think that by defending her, that she's going to like them and potentially do fuck tapes with them, which is never going to happen. She's not going to fuck you. So as a result, stop kissing her ass and stop buying into this feminazi bullshit about how the woman is always the innocent fucking victim. And the point is, we don't know what happened. So until we know what happened, either both of them should be suspended by the respective companies or neither one of them should be suspended by the respective companies. I think it's ridiculous that Alberto El Patron is the one that gets suspended here, that everybody talks about him and how bad of an influence he is on her. She's batshit crazy, period. And at this point in time, if anything, it would seem like she's the one that's a negative influence on him because, oh my, he's the one that just got suspended. But of course, as so often is the case in our society, she has zero culpability, zero responsibility, zero that she's being held accountable to. Everybody's making excuses for her and trying to defend her. All I want to see is not equality out of convenience, but equality that is actually equal. And to me, this is a situation that is ripe with hypocrisy. 
If Alberto El Patron was suspended, then Paige should have been suspended. Granted, different companies, but I'm saying, if WWE is supposed to respect their women so much, then they should also respect that women need to be held accountable and responsible. And until you find out more information, and until you investigate this, Paige should have been suspended too. Because even then, at least you wouldn't have to pay her a downside guarantee. But in the meantime, Global Force Wrestling still has a few weeks to kind of figure this all out. It makes you wonder if they really made the right decision putting on the belt on him at Slammiversary, even though they didn't know this was coming. Was he really the right guy that you wanted carrying the strap as you were kind of rebranding yourself? I don't know. But for the company for the time being, they still have a couple of weeks to figure it out. And it's kind of interesting that after Slammiversary, the last two weeks have been the most watched impacts of the entire year. That's really interesting. Now, maybe some of that was some positive buzz from Slammiversary. Uh, last Thursday got people to watch. And then maybe this Thursday, people wanted to see what happened because of the news of Alberto Al Patron. We'll see what happens next week. But ultimately, he's going to be on TV because they don't have much of a choice. They don't have to strip him yet. And that's the best thing for GFW in this situation is because of how their product is and the fact that they tape weeks of television ahead of time, they can kick that can down the road. I just think it's ridiculous that everybody focuses on the Alberto El Patron aspect of this and lumps nothing onto Paige. And she's able to get off basically scot-free and nobody's calling for her to be suspended. And that's bullshit. The other big news for me for the week was Kevin Kelly making the announcement that he was leaving ROH to focus on his New Japan duties. And I've, I've always felt like Kevin Kelly, when I would, the rare times I would actually bother to tune into ROH, which believe me, isn't much. I don't want to watch that kind of karate, jujitsu, no-selling bullshit. And frankly, a lot of you don't either. Even if it is the only thing you see on TV at 12.35 in the morning on a Sinclair station near you, you ain't trying to watch that crap. But Kevin Kelly focusing more on New Japan. I wanted to just say this about Kevin Kelly. I think he's really, really solid as a play-by-play -play guy. I really, really do. If he's going to be the guy that does the pay-per-views going forward for New Japan and not Jim Ross, I'd be okay with that too because Kevin Kelly is going to be clearly more familiar with the characters, more familiar with the stories, and you know he'll be able to keep up better. It will just be better. Probably not the best thing in the world for ROH, but frankly, from my standpoint, I'm not watching, and frankly, a lot of you, let's be honest, really aren't either. But usually you don't want to get rid of guys or lose guys that are assets. And I'm surprised ROH allowed this to happen. I'm surprised that Kevin Kelly left ROH uh, in the manner that he has. But maybe it speaks to just not even wanting to deal with Sinclair Broadcasting's bullshit. Maybe it's just Kevin Kelly enjoys the New Japan product more. Maybe they're offering him more money. It could be a variety of things. Maybe he realizes ROH isn't going anywhere and he sees New Japan potentially growing and trying to become more of a international brand and getting a bit of a foothold into the U.S. marketplace, and he wants to be a part of that. I wish him the best. It sucks for ROH, but it's a good thing for New Japan. I just wish there were more commentators in the business like Kevin Kelly that were actually competent at their job. They didn't get caught up in bullshit that actually told the story that they need to tell. So let's talk about the wrestling week that was and some of the shows that were going on. Great Balls of Fire had its moments. That Roman Reigns, Braun Strowman ambulance match I thought was outstanding. Joe and Lesnar started off really hot and then the finish was just lame and fucking disappointing. 1F5 is going to end it. Look, I'm not big on kicking out of finishers all the time, but... Maybe Lesnar should have wanted to hit a second or even third F5 just to make sure he had put Joe away, is what I'm saying. And you're kind of fighting an uphill battle with me at this point to get me really, really sucked into wanting to see these two guys wrestle again because I've already seen Lesnar beat Joe. The babyfaces went over the heel in theory. Where's the story? Why bother at this point? And then the whole thing with Roman Reigns and Braun Strowman, I can't believe it. And I take responsibility for this in part because there are so many gullible fucking wrestling fans and so many people that come on here and talk about the WWE that just fall into the same traps of saying the same stupid crap and getting fooled time after time after time and they don't learn their lessons, I should have hammered this point home more. If you thought that the WWE was going to turn Roman Reigns heel, he has to, he freaking hit him in an ambulance, you thought they were going to pull off some type of double turn, you're stupid on so many fucking levels. What reality, what 
plane are you living on in terms of the WWE and who they are today? The WWE doesn't even know what a double turn is anymore. They most certainly wouldn't know how to do it, and they certainly probably wouldn't even want to put themselves in a position where they would have to consider it because that might require actual creative work, and we know that they really don't want to do that. But furthermore, when Braun tips Roman over in the ambulance, it's a babyface move. When Roman gets his revenge after losing the match and getting pissed off and backs the ambulance into the fucking thing and Strowman's in it, that's a heel move. That's bullshit. If anything, that's revenge. Just saying. And on top of that, Braun's already been babyface for a while. Roman, frankly, even though the WWE doesn't try to book him that way, based off of audience reaction, at least from the male demographic, is a heel. Now, women and kids love him. So again, we get back into the scene of 2.0 crap. But it was this whole thing of, if the WWE didn't turn Cena heel after all those goddamn years, what makes you think that they would intentionally do that with Roman Reigns? And what makes you think that would be a good thing? And what makes you think that would maximize the return of time and energy and money they've invested into Roman Reigns and his character the past few years? Roman Reigns could be a heel, and then what, eventually start cheering him, and then again the whole dynamics are off of it. Oh, you want to boo him, so now you've got to reason to boo him. It's not going to make any fucking difference. If the WWE doesn't want to do it, they're not going to do it, and it's just that. And I can't believe so many people were so sucked in Sunday night, so stupidly, thinking that this was some type of indication of a Roman Reigns heel turn, or a possible double turn. The fuck are people smoking? I'm excited to see potentially this four-way between Joe and Lesnar and Roman and Braun potentially at SummerSlam, and let's see if that's where the WWE goes. Uh, but at least I can say with great balls of fire, I was excited going into it, and you can check out my review on this channel. I felt like while it could have been better, it most certainly could have been a whole lot worse. Extreme rules, extreme rules. Anyways, we got the tapings for the Mae Young Classic, and I was really confused because when I saw Mae Young Classic trending on Twitter, I actually went to the WWE Network, and I thought I was actually going to watch it on Thursday night. Didn't realize that it was being taped, and then we're going to start airing it next month. I thought that was, frankly, kind of a mistake. Now you've allowed the spoilers to be out there for a month and a half. I don't know why the WWE didn't do this live. They hyped this up to be some big thing. Why not have this play out over several weeks again? Probably an expense thing, trying to save some money. But if that's the case, how much of an audience do you think this thing is really going to get on the network? And in that case, why the fuck do it? Um, you got 32 women in this tournament. I'll be probably checking it out some of it at least, to see what's going on. I'm sure a lot of you are going to be checking out all of it, and bless your hearts. But if you're going to ask me if I care a great deal about it, no. And I actually feel like the WWE did a poor job of communicating, knowing this information was going to go out there, knowing that they're tweeting about Ronda Rousey's there. Like, who gives a shit about that and that sensitive-ass bitch? Oh, the four horsewomen. off. Oh, fuck off. Who cares? Oh, they're there watching. Who fucking cares? But with this Mae Young Classic, I was legitimately confused. And I know I can't be the only one that was legitimately confused and thought that it was actually showing on the WWE Network, not going to be taped and then shown a month and a half later. That way, so many spoilers could already be released. And one way or another, I'd probably find out about some of this stuff. I was just kind of, um, kind of odd to me. Kind of odd to me. As I referenced earlier, Global Force Wrestling got their highest rating of 2017 on Pop TV this past week. It's just ironic. And sometimes maybe it speaks to a disconnect uh, for me with wrestling fans in general today because while the show was a little bit better than the week before, I still don't think this wrestling was very, very good. The show in general was very, very good at all. And yet it's the most watched show of the year. Just strange. Just strange. And again, could that tie into potentially interest being peaked a little bit because of Alberto Al Patron and the information out there that he was suspended and people were curious to see what's going on? I don't really know. But... Good for Global Force Wrestling. I would like to see their product actually do something to try and establish a brand, a new identity, or any type of brand or identity at all. But two weeks straight, you've gotten a slight uptick in audience, in viewership. And knowing that company's history and probably their present, that's what they live for. They don't get nearly the viewership they used to. But it's something. And you know what? I'm glad I'm back watching Impact every week. And I hope that this company... Forget it. After all these years, why am I hoping that they're going to figure anything out?
So now let's go between the sheets and talk about some of the biggest rumors that have been out there on the dirt sheets this past week. And the first one revolves around who Kurt Angle's been texting the past few weeks and who ultimately is going to show up Monday night on Raw. There's a sick kind of interest and borderline fascination with this for a lot of us. And I know there are a lot of people that want to say it's going to be Stephanie and want to believe that it's going to be Stephanie. And, and there are definitely storyline reasons that you can make that work, especially if you were trying to build up potentially to a Kurt Angle Triple H match at SummerSlam or in the future, especially it seems like with Kurt Angle kind of pining to want to get back in the ring. But with that said, though, we all know what everybody wants. And why is that? Because I'm telling you it's what you want, damn it. Hashtag we want Dixie. You know, for so long, we've watched this WWE product and it's become stale and it's dull and it's repetitive and there's not much in the way of spontaneity. Dixie Carter showing up on Raw, who the hell would have thought that would ever happen? So, even though it's going to probably be a trash storyline, who's to say that the storyline involving Stephanie, frankly, would be any fucking good? And at this point in time, why do you want to see Stephanie McMahon back on TV so goddamn bad? I'm all down for Dixie Carter being this person. Hashtag we want Dixie. Hashtag we want Dixie. Imagine if she comes out there and he, she grabs the mic and she says, well, let me tell you something, darling. Once she says darling, yes, people are going to know. For those of you that sit there and say, who would fucking know? All right, these are the same people that when somebody debuts from NXT, you know, these guys get a reaction because a lot of the fans that actually buy these tickets in terms of the adult males do watch NXT and these other shows, the independent shows, what have you. So these guys, when they debut, get a big reaction. You don't think Dixie Carter's going to be known? You don't think Dixie Carter's going to get a reaction? And even if she doesn't, that's going to be fucking epic and classic too. Like, to me, Stephanie McMahon are saying, hey, we'll utilize a young woman's wrestler in this storyline. Fuck that bullshit. We've been there. We've done that. Let's go with the, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. This is a moment no matter where it goes. Imagine Dixie Carter. Just think about this for a second. Dixie Carter, part of a WWE storyline, a featured WWE storyline associated with Kurt Angle on Monday Night Raw. You're goddamn right. Hashtag we want Dixie. We want Dixie. Because no matter what, even if it boils down to if you're asking who really wants Dixie, the point is all of us do. Because either this is going to be epic good or it's going to be epic suck. And either way, that could be great for a lot of people. And it most certainly could be great for me from a video standpoint. So please don't take this away from me. Hashtag we want Dixie. Speaking of other rumors involving WWE people, apparently both Enzo and Big Cass are partners in heat, even though the team has been split up. Apparently Enzo's upset, legit shoot that the team got split up, which I can kind of understand because him and Cass have been together a while through NXT and on the WWE roster. They were at WrestleMania together and there could be some real concern for Enzo kind of seeing the writing on the wall is, well, if Cass goes off and do, does his own thing, what does that mean for me? And he probably has some bitterness to say, hey, we never got the tag titles. We had more mileage to go. And he's absolutely right. Uh, the big story, though, that apparently he did something that was so aggravating that he got the mistreatment. Roman, of all people, uh, apparently it is his yard now, kicked him off the bus. And for a while, they weren't letting him change the locker room. I wonder what Enzo did to piss off so many people. I can see where he could be potentially annoying, aggravating, and get under people's skin. But what did he do that was so bad that Roman kicked him off the bus? That's what I'd love to know. And they gave him the freaking mistreatment. Man, he must be one annoying SOB in the locker room to get the mistreatment. Good God. Uh, and then you've got Big Cass, who apparently is getting a lot of heat because he's a major Trump supporter and he doesn't shy away um, from talking about it. And, and it's funny. Because apparently a lot of the roster isn't on board with Trump, and they most certainly aren't Trump supporters, even though I don't know if I fully buy that assertion. Uh, but let's pretend that is true. The real truth is, is maybe part of the reason Cass is getting pushed so much is because he is a Trump supporter. You have to remember, the same company whose CEO, Vince McMahon, spent $100 million of his own money to try and buy his wife a Senate seat twice, and it ultimately rolled craps both times, the same Linda McMahon who is now head of the Small Business Administration under the Trump administration, 
You really think Vince is okay with a bunch of people crapping on the Trump administration, one of his great friends? After all, Trump in the Battle of the Billionaires, WrestleMania 23, Donald Trump's in the WWE Hall of Fame. You really think Vince, and knowing Vince, that he would be that upset if somebody like Cass would speak up and defend Donald Trump and buy into that bloviating windbags bullshit? Hell, if anything, that might be why he's getting pushed, and it might be the reason he continues to get pushed. And frankly, from Cass's standpoint, if you want to be stupid and support that knuckle, it's so fucking be it, because at this point in time, it might be the best damn thing possible for your career. Because if you make it known that you're a Trump guy, then you probably, by default, especially being a big, tall dude like you are, end up being a Vince guy too. And if you end up being a Vince guy, you're going to get paid. You're going to get money. And then you will actually benefit from some of Donald Trump's potential tax policies. It's incredible, though. These young guys getting this heat like this. One, because apparently he's an annoying twit. And the other one, because he's a raging Trump supporter. Like, I work with people that are raging Trump supporters. I don't. They don't get a bunch of heat from fucking me. I think they're stupid and stuff. More so because of what they say to defend them is just ridiculous and just not backed up by any real factual evidence. But, again, I don't get, they don't get a bunch of heat from me. In fact, if anything, I like talking to them. I like engaging with them. I don't just want to hear people that agree with me. If anything, I want to hear people that disagree with me that have different viewpoints. That's the whole point of being kind of open-minded, isn't it? Why would Cass have heat for talking about Donald Trump and for the wrestlers in the WWE that don't like it? Then clown on the fucking dude. Don't put a bunch of heat on him. Don't whine and bitch like you fucking crybaby, mamby pambies always fucking do. Do something about it. Call him out on that shit. Clown him on that shit. If you don't, I will. That's fine, whatever. But you guys should be strong enough in your conviction and your belief to be able to be willing to hear what he has to say and then poke holes in his logic all over the place. It's just, what a stupid reason for a guy to get a ton of heat. I could see if he conducted himself in an arrogant kind of prick manner, he didn't appreciate the push that he was getting. I could understand a lot of that shit. But for his political views? Come on, man. There's better reasons to give somebody heat than that in a locker room. That's just dumb. And it's, again, just a reflection of how stupid the wrestling business has gotten and how full of pussies it really is. Honestly. And speaking of just dumb shit, this whole ordeal between the Hardys and Global Force Wrestling and whether or not there's a deal in place for the Hardys to be able to use the broken gimmick in WWE. You know, it's, it's one of these deals where it's kind of like in one way karma kind of collects on the WWE for sitting there and cock blocking Cody from using the Rhodes name. You didn't have any real purpose to have to use keep Cody from using the Rhodes name. You just did it to fuck with the guy. And that's that immature bullshit, that childish shit that WWE does as a company. They just like to fuck with people sometimes. And they want to stick in the... Who the hell was Cody in the grand scheme of things? Let him go. Let him do his own thing. You don't need him. Honestly, and he probably didn't need you either. He's going to do just fine in Japan. So why are you going to sit there and try and block the dude? It's just dumb. It's childish. <clears throat> but now you look at Global Force Wrestling... They're kind of being childish here, too, if you believe some of the reports. You know, wanting to sit there and present themselves as being slandered by, in particular, uh, Rebby, uh, but also Matt and Jeff as well, and wanting to make sure that they get some type of financial compensation because they, they believe that they have ownership over the gimmick, which there is, you know, some legal ground potentially for them to stand on, but there is also uh, some legal danger if Global Force Wrestling continues to push this. Were they actually paying people like Senor Benjamin and others to be a part of this? Were there any type of procedures in place for utilizing King Maxiel as child labor on this show? And that might sound stupid, but these are real major serious issues that I guarantee you for a company that has a history over the past few years of not being able to pay the wrestlers on time, didn't even think about these type of things. But again, they are major, significant, serious issues to consider. So be careful when you pick and choose your battles, that you don't dig a, a freaking foxhole in on the wrong one. And when it comes to Global Force Wrestling, at some point in time, the report's talking about you want half of the Hardy or Jeff Hardy's revenue from his artwork and shit. Come on now. If you're that cash-strapped, then maybe you're in the wrong business. Or B, if they meant that much to you, then maybe you should have ponied up the dough to keep both of the fucking guys. 
But see, now you get to the point where if you continue to fight this, you're going to piss off some of the people in the locker room because they're not going to like this whole intellectual property fight and what it could potentially mean for them down the road. It's just they're not there anymore. That shit that predates the, the name change to Global Force Wrestling. Move on from it. Get the fuck over it. I'm not saying Global Force doesn't have some legs to stand on in terms of, hey, they deserve some type of compensation for this. I don't disagree with them on that. But when do you get to the point of saying enough is enough? Because how many times have we heard about a potential deal happening and then it falls through? A deal happens, it's about to happen, then it falls through. It's agreed to, then it falls through. And that's all Global Force Wrestling at this point. Grow up. Pick and choose your battles better. Know when enough is enough and it's time to let bygones be bygones and let shit go. And instead of continuing to fight this battle over the Hardys in a fucking gimmick that you're frankly not going to be able to use anymore for all intents and purposes... Let WWE have it. Let it go. Get something for it and move the fuck on and focus on what's more important when that is establishing the identity of your new name for your company and what your product is going to be going forward. And instead of focusing on past shit, why don't you focus on the next kind of phenom type of thing, the next type of thing that could get over like the whole broken, delete, obsolete type of gimmick did. Why not worry about creating that instead of trying to block the Hardys from doing it somewhere else? It's just childish at this point in time. Just again, because you have some legal legs to stand on, doesn't mean you need to stubbornly dig in here. Because all you're going to end up doing is looking like jackasses, which would be appropriate for this company after all these years. So let's talk about trend this, and that's some of the notable things that happened on social media this week. Number one, thanks to all of you that did your part to try and get WWE balls trending on Twitter Sunday night during Great Balls of Fire. While it didn't quite happen, enough people tweeted about hashtag WWE balls, where it still feels like a success. I have to say that I popped quite a bit seeing the back and forth between Miz and Ty Dillinger on Twitter. I wish they utilized social media better, more effectively as a company uh, to start off some rivalries and start off some storylines. But again, that would mean that they'd actually have to build stories and God knows this company isn't going to do it. Oh, but man, these dudes are clowning each other. I, I, I thought it was a lot of fun. And if you didn't get a chance to read them, go go look at their tweets back and forth. It was pretty good. But the biggest thing I wanted to talk about were um, the fact that X-Pac and Road Dog both blocked OTR etc. on Twitter, Twitter over the course of the past week. And again, it just speaks to the pussification of wrestling in general. I'm not a guy that goes and hurls a ton of like F-bombs and those type of insults at people in wrestling, especially in WWE, to get blocked. It's more so... Yeah, well, you guys like Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, I kind of get because I, I definitely had jokes at their expense for him. But it's people like Chris Jericho and Mick Foley and some of the other guys, and now X Pac and Road Dog most certainly can add to the list of when they say stupid shit. Don't be surprised when somebody questions you. And if you're going to say stupid shit and not be able to defend it, maybe you shouldn't say it at all. And it speaks to just a general lack of confidence in the WWE and it speaks to an overall sense of insecurity for so many people in that company. X-Pac talking about how more people are making a living in professional wrestling today than at any point in time since the territory days. That's just complete crap. Uh, do we not count the 90s? We don't think that all those people in WWF, WCW, ECW, New Japan, All Japan, they weren't able to make a living? Give me a break. And to sit there and say that the WWE's economic picture is as strong as it's ever been, if not more so, is just completely divergent from reality. And when you cite tweets such as the fact that the revenue for WWE is three times what it was 18 years ago, you're also not factoring in inflation, which makes a big difference. You're also not factoring in that the WWE is running twice as many shows as they used to. You've done a brand split. So while you're airing Raw, you have SmackDown house shows. When you're airing SmackDown, you have Raw house shows. When a SmackDown pay-per-view or Raw pay-per-view is going on, the other brand is doing a freaking live event. It's just not an applicable comparison, especially because at that time, WrestleMania, even though they could have done WrestleMania in big stadiums, they didn't. You know, WrestleMania 14, WrestleMania 15, WrestleMania 2000. Those weren't in big 60, 70,000 seat venues. They weren't. WrestleMania 17 was. WrestleMania 18 was. 
but you're comparing that to where the WWE every year now runs WrestleMania in a big venue, and now they're doing SummerSlam in a big venue. They just did Royal Rumble in a big venue. It's just not comparable. But it's one of these things where people will buy into this because somebody like Xbox says it. No, just because somebody in wrestling says it doesn't mean it's accurate or anywhere close to the truth whatsoever. And doesn't mean that it doesn't deserve to be questioned. Doesn't mean you have to insult people, but it's a valid question. To sit there and say, well, you're making three times as much money, again, comparing the value of $1999 to $2017, you have to factor in a whole lot of inflation. When you do factor in inflation and you look at 1999 compared to 2016 and you look at the fact that the profit level for 1999 was three times as large with a much smaller uh, expense sheet, that should be concerning for WWE. They really dove into this WWE network and they're still hovering around 1.5 million subscribers and they have distribution, I believe, in about 170 countries. They struggle with some of their live events for Raw and SmackDown to sell out. Some of their pay-per-views, they don't sell out until the very last minute. Raw's and SmackDown TV tapings, they don't always sell out until the last minute. Sometimes they don't at all. You know, back in those times during the Attitude Era, they were selling out every goddamn show. Every show started off with them talking about how it was a sellout crowd of da-da-da and da-da-da. And the television ratings were at least twice what they are now, if not two and a half times. I mean, it's just... For Xbox to sit there and basically try to paint a picture that WWE's financials are as good as ever, if not better, is just delusional bullshit. When your expenses are twice what they, or excuse me, really three times what they used to be, but your profit levels are a third of what they used to be 18 years ago once you adjust for inflation, um, how is that an indication that things are going well? That's an indication of things trending in the wrong direction and the WWE having to continue to overextend themselves and saturate the marketplace even more in order to bring in more revenue with the hope of being able to potentially break even. At some point in time, you stretch yourself too thin, you really create a potential disastrous financial picture and a financial situation. That's what WWE is doing. So when somebody like Xbox talks about financials, if he's talking about the financials of how much he can buy and sell drugs for, take his word for it. When he talks about financials of the WWE, he lacks clearly a basic fundamental understanding of business in America. He just does. And then Road Dog, what was really stupid this week, and probably even more idiotic than people thinking that Roman Reigns was going to turn heel and that WWE is doing some type of double turn between him and Strowman, was that Road Dog said that pyro and special stages just aren't necessary, and basically in three months, nobody will be talking about them, that they're just not needed. I wonder if Undertaker and Kane and Goldberg and some of those guys over the years would agree that you know, the Dudleys, that we don't need any type of pyro. Shawn Michaels probably doesn't think that his entrance where he did all of this crap on the ramp, he didn't need those fireworks going off behind him. Special stages? Ah, who needs a special stage? It's just another wrestling show. I mean, are we that desperate to defend the WWE's cost cutting because they're not doing the business that they should and they're not doing the business that they once did to where we come up with the most asinine, ridiculous defense mechanisms possible? Like professional wrestling, even especially if you want to call it sports entertainment like WWE does, it's sports entertainment. It's supposed to be about theater and spectacle. You take away the special customized stages for the big events, in particular the pay-per-views, and you take away the pyro, then nothing special about it. If I tune in to watch a pay-per-view for Raw, and it's the same set that you use for Raw, like with Great Balls of Fire, then it just feels like Raw. Then why would I eventually feel like I have to plunk down $9.99 a month to watch on the network when I could just watch basically the same shit on Raw, which isn't all that untrue because so many of the matches that do on the pay-per-view, they'll just rewind and rematch them the next fucking night on Raw anyway. So if you didn't watch it Sunday, they give it back to you on Monday night any damn ways. But how ridiculous. If a special stage didn't mean anything, then why does WWE spend seven figures to build a WrestleMania set every year? Then why not just plunk down a Raw or SmackDown set for WrestleMania? If that's the case, then the big stadiums don't freaking matter. Other than you could sit there and say for the amount of revenue they generate, then jack up the ticket prices three or four times as much and hold it in a 20000 street seat arena because it doesn't fucking matter it doesn't need to feel any bigger because again it doesn't matter we don't need it and to say that pyros aren't needed i'm not saying you need to do pyros liberally across the board for everybody but to sit there and say that they carry no intrinsic value that they don't matter and in a few months we don't won't talk about them 
It's just ridiculous. If people aren't going to talk about them in a few months, it's going to be because they've stopped watching your product, you stupid idiot. I mean, my God. And I think isn't Road Dog the lead writer of SmackDown? And for some of you that have been watching SmackDown lately and haven't thought it's particularly good, maybe this is an indication of why it's not very good. An idiot that should know better, a multiple time tag team champion, a guy that got himself over with catchphrases and that's about it. This guy here, the same guy that was a part of a DX invasion of WCW where they rode on a freaking tank. According to Road Dogg's logic, they might as well just walked up or rode on fucking Schwinn bicycles instead of a goddamn tank. Sometimes you have to spend money to make money. And to talk about WWE, whose CEO, Vince McMahon, believes they're in the movie-making business. Imagine doing some type of summer blockbuster and not doing one type of special effect, one explosion, one anything like that at all. You'd laugh at that shit and you'd say, this is the biggest piece of crap ever. Why the hell would I watch it? That's the same thing WWE fans are saying. And it just speaks again to just in general, the corporate being down of the product and watering it down to make everything feel the same. Therefore, nothing stands out. And we try to come up with these dumbass reasons to defend it. One, the simple fact of the matter is it's just because the WWE is trying to cut costs. But if you even sit there and just say it's to cut costs, I understand that. But to sit there and pretend like it's not about cutting costs and it's just a matter of you just don't really need it anymore. These are the people that are influencing the business today still. These are the people like Road Dog that have voices in the creative process of WWE. When you look at the product and you say what a steaming pile of shit it is, it's because of dumb dick idiots like this believing bullshit like this and putting it out there like this that helps make the WWE product as bad as it is. Can you fucking imagine The Undertaker without ever having any type of druids, any type of smoke, any type of special effects, no lightning bolts coming out, no caskets catching on fire. Imagine Kane, if you never had any fucking pyro at the beginning of his entrance, never did the thing where the flames shot out of the fucking turnbuckles, none of that shit. My God. The people in wrestling are so fucking stupid. And it just, if anything else, I deep down like to believe that it's not Road Dog possibly being that stupid. It's that he's trying to be a good soldier. But if this is what being a good soldier in WWE means at this point, like the ridiculous defenses you see on a lot of issues, issues sometimes are just unbelievable. And this right here has to be one of the biggest examples of being a blind, dumb dick sheep that I've heard of in quite some time. We don't need pyros or special stages. Then just dress the wrestlers all the same. Then stop paying anybody to create entrance music. Stop showing replays. Have one commentator instead of three, or hell, have no commentators at all, although that might be an improvement to the product. Why do any backstage pre-tapes? Literally every segment should be a match, 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 match. Because we don't need to stand out. We don't need to be different. How fucking stupid. So when you go back in the wrestling time machine, what were some notable things that happened during this past week in years past? Number one, Black Saturday back in 1984 when Vince bought <laughs> TBS's television time slot uh, <laughs> and basically said, ta-da, thank you, Jack and Jerry Briscoe and Jim Barnett. Now, instead of you tuning in to watch Georgia Championship Wrestling, you're going to see some good old WWF highlights and fucking house show squash match bullshit. And what's funny is if you've ever watched the McMahon DVD, how they try to sell this and how they try to spin this. Talk about how it was a great attempt at a one-two into the cable marketplace. And Ted was talking about he wanted to buy his wrestling company this wrestling company and they said he would sell it to the Crockett's and then if he wanted to buy it from the Crockett's just go a complete load of shit and really honestly Black Saturday and the immediate aftermath of it was a disaster for the WWF it was a complete disaster you had all types of fans writing into the network pissed off about where their freaking Georgia Championship Wrestling was was at it did crappier ratings by comparison to both Bill Watts's and Georgia Championship Wrestling's product um this was not a financial success. Eventually, they had to sell it to the Crockett's because they were losing money on it. This was a time even before WrestleMania won. So to sit there and assert like they did years back, especially Shane, that this was something that in any way, shape, or form 
was anything other than a major fuck you and a major flop for WWF. It's just complete historical revisionist bullshit. But think about that, though. That happened 33 years ago. And still people have talked about it. And I've actually had a conversation with Jerry Briscoe about it before. And it was interesting, to say the least, but I won't share those details here. Uh, what else happened? I believe it was 29 years ago on this date, actually, that Bruiser Brody died from his stab wounds when he was murdered by, um, who was it, Invader Number 1 or whoever the fuck it was. Um, what, what a shame. You know, what would ever get to the point in professional wrestling where you would basically off a dude in the freaking shower and stab him to death? And then the whole cover-up and the fact that nobody ever faced justice for it. And Carlos Colon, who helped cover it up, is now in the WWE Hall of Fame. is sickening. Um, 29 years ago, Bruiser Brody uh, passed away. That was a long, long time ago. And six years ago this past week, or coming up, whatever it was, Money in the Bank 2011, where a lot of you were sucked in somehow in a world of work that CM Punk actually won the title without already being under contract with WWE. Just like the dumbest shit imaginable. But you look at, back at that, and so many people love that main event match between Cena and Punk. And yes, it was a great match. You're there in Chicago. The crowd is electric. It was a night. It was a moment. But I always look back at that moment, and I say, imagine the possibility of what could have been and then what the WWE did. Instead of following up on the story for months, they did knee-jerk reflex bullshit. They panicked, brought Punk back on TV eight days later just to have him work at fucking SummerSlam. Just so that way, going forward, he could job out in several state pay-per-views after that shit. Just a bunch of dumb bullshit. Dumb bullshit. Especially <laughs> doing the honors for God. Praise God! But you think about that. That was six years ago. And six years later, Punk is gone from WWE with no return in sight. For so many people thought this was going to be the beginning of a new generation. I hope you realize it wasn't the beginning of shit, but more bitter and complete disappointment. And that's frustrating for a lot of people because it shouldn't have to be like that, but it is. And with CM Punk, you look at the potential, the possibility of what could have been, but ultimately, if the WWE doesn't buy into it, it's not going to matter. Six years ago, though, just think about that. Six years ago, Money in the Bank 2011 happened. And CM Punk's no longer with the company. And you look back at that storyline. I don't know about you, but that has to be one of the most disappointing clusterfucks of whatever the hell they were thinking that WWE has had over the past 10 to 15 years. Like, you had the possibility of having one epic storyline. But you couldn't even rip off ROH right. That's how stupid... The WWE is. But now let's take a look at the week ahead in professional wrestling. You've got New Japan and their G1 uh, Climax Tournament begins. A series of events that last over a month to where you culminate with the big blow off. I'll try and watch some of it. I don't know how much of it I'm going to watch. But I'll keep you guys updated via social media on what I'm actually going to watch. And what if anything I'm going to potentially review on it. You've got Raw coming up on Monday. You've got Samoa Joe versus Roman Reigns. The winner of that is in place to, or slotted, excuse me, to take on Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. I'd expect something screwy happens here where Strowman gets involved and we get the four-way. And, and frankly, that's the direction the company needs to go at this point. They've got to go with the four-way, uh, whether it's fatal four-way or it's elimination four-way, probably be a fatal four-way at SummerSlam. You might as well go all balls in with these guys in one big story. Give us at least one big story with several moving parts. That could be really, really good. And we're also going to find out who Kurt Angle's mystery love is. Hashtag, we want Dixie. We want Dixie. And if you don't want Dixie, then fuck you. Uh, Smackdown, it's their go-home show before Battleground, and that's about all I can going to talk about with that. Um, Battleground is coming up this Sunday. I'll be watching. I'll be reviewing. We'll see if it's any good or not. Also, for those of you that are in the Midwest in particular, and just in general, kind of a heads up, this upcoming uh, Friday and Saturday, you've got the George Tragos Luthes Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame weekend at the Dan Gable Museum in Waterloo, Iowa. I know it's a mouthful, but I can tell you for somebody that's been involved as a volunteer in the past and as a spectator in the past, 
If you are a real true wrestling fan, it is something you need to put on your bucket list of something you do at least once in your lifetime. This year, the event is being headlined by Mr. Wonderful himself, Paul Orndorff. Mr. Wonderful. Who is Mr. Wonderful? Paul Orndorff. Who is Paul Orndorff? Mr. Wonderful. Why is he Mr. Wonderful? Because he's fucking Paul Orndorff, damn it. My only regret is that I'm not able to go there and meet the legend himself, Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. But Jim Ross is there. Jerry Briscoe's there. J.J. Dillon's going to be there. Uh, there's other guys that are going to be there too, just like there is every year. It's really a great event. Uh, Troy Peterson and the Impact Pro Wrestling people put on a phenomenal show on Friday nights. Uh, they're at the convention center, and they do a great job of incorporating the legends. I'm trying to think of who's going to be there this year. Oh, American Alpha is going to be there this year, um, making an appearance. I believe Ricochet is going to be there, I think. Um, I don't have the whole uh, poster in front of me. But again, if you are a wrestling fan and you've been to Cauliflower Alley and you've been to WrestleCon and some of these other things, to me this is one of those those undercover events that doesn't get nearly the buzz or attention it deserves. Like uh, last year, Meltzer was there. This year, I believe Wade Keller is going to be there. Um, these are the type of events that if you are a true blue wrestling fan and you love the history of professional wrestling and you love talking about uh, wrestling days of old um, and being around other wrestling fans and seeing great merch and seeing great artifacts, uh, like a copy of Maurice Tiller's death mask, um, one of Brett the Hitman Hart's jackets, uh, you know, so many other things there at the museum. You've got to go at least once in your life. I've been a part of the event a couple of times, and hopefully I'll be able to go back in a future year. I hope so. But for you, maybe not this year, but if you are in the Midwest and you figure out a way to go, please go. I promise you it'll be worth it. And if you haven't gone before and you're a wrestling fan, you need to go in the future. It is a great time and a wonderful experience, even if it is a little bit out of the way in good old Waterloo, Iowa. And if anything else, if anything else, if you want to see these legends of wrestling act like little kids and be marks, just wait until Saturday afternoon every year when Dan Gable actually walks into the museum that bears his name. I'll never forget in 2012, I'm, I'm standing next to Road Warrior Animal, and there's Jim Ross sitting here. There's JBL sitting here. And you're doing the autograph signing. And all of a sudden, Dan Gable walks in. And I shit you not, literally everybody that's signing stops and gets up to take a picture with Dan Gable. That's when you know you're a badass dude. That's when you know you're a real true legend. And that's the type of shit that you can only see as part of that George Tragos Luthez Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame weekend at the Dan Gable Museum this upcoming Friday and Saturday in Waterloo, Iowa. If you've never been before, go. It should be on your bucket list of something to do as a wrestling fan. And then we get to what I call the hot finish, where I'm going to spend a couple of minutes at the end of each Off the Rope show just giving a hot take on something. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I think it's been okay. I don't know how great it's been, honestly. But we'll get better at it, I promise you. And in the future, probably going to incorporate some other people up to and including some tasteless ones, some marvelous ones, some metal ones, and maybe a Mr. Route 2. Who knows? Uh, but the hot finish for this week is when will OTRS Central get some love? Now, maybe part of the reason this channel doesn't have a bigger audience is because of the way I conduct carry myself sometimes. Maybe it's because I'm not so pro uh, some of the indie guys and some of the Japan guys that a lot of these other guys are and sometimes I tell you what I feel like you need to hear as opposed to what you want to hear and you don't really want to hear what you need to hear so that's why the audience isn't bigger maybe it dates back to shit that goes years back which again is kind of ridiculous because now basically everybody but me is asking for donations all I'm asking you to do is if you want a t-shirt buy a fucking t-shirt but I've never understood no wrestling promotion has ever reached out to me and wanted me to be a part of anything whatsoever. No wrestling promotion has reached out to me to try and get any wrestlers on my show whatsoever. Or on my channel whatsoever. I hardly have ever get any request from any wrestling websites to be a contributor at all. Um, really, I never do. And there are people with much smaller followings that are frankly terrible when you, in comparison to me. I feel comfortable in saying that. 
that get these opportunities, even if it is just getting paid in exposure and audience size, I would appreciate that exposure and audience size. And a lot of these other channels, big and small, I've never understood why, and after six plus years, I feel like I deserve a little more respect than what I get. And I feel like I should be more involved than what I really am. And I don't know what it is. And I'm sure part of it is due to me. And maybe this is going to kind of sound like sour grapes. You know what? It fucking kind of is sour grapes. Because I see these people with lower subscriber numbers, lower viewership totals, that get to be a part of wrestling promotions, that get brought to wrestling shows, get to be a part of this, and you know, other people ask them to be a part of their channels, and so on and so forth. And like nobody, almost nobody, almost nobody ever fucking asks the Schleg Daddy to do so. Like who's got to get a reach around here for the Schleg Daddy to get some goddamn respect and for OTRS Central to get some damn respect? It's horrible. But you know what? If these people aren't on board, if these people don't want to bring me on, then fuck them. We don't need them. We'll get big and bad without any of them. And then when the time comes, we'll force them to and give them no choice. It's just bullshit. That after all this time of doing it, it's like, I do have an audience of some type and nobody seems to fucking care. I don't, I don't know. I, I just don't know. But again, it is what it is. When is this channel, when am I going to get some fucking love? But you know what? If I'm not going to get it, then by God, I'm going to take it. So thanks to all of you that have watched over the years, that continue to watch, continue to support the show. I thank you. And we're going to do it. We're going to hashtag make wrestling fun again. We are going to do this thing bigger, better, brighter than we ever have. And always remember with the Off the Rope Show, since 2010, we've been entertaining ourselves while you watch. And this is the OTRS Central channel where it's not the wrestling show you want. It's the, just the wrestling show you need. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'll see you later.